guys, but I am so thrilled to be here. Leveraging play and fun for serious impact is my deepest passion, and it is so nice to be surrounded by like-minded enthusiasts. Um, so, yes, the purpose of today's talk is how to make serious things fun, and my goal is that you leave here today with some tangible tools and techniques for driving change and impact wherever um, you are the most passionate. So, how to make serious things fun um, using uh, animations from Keynote. That is my talk. Um, <laughs> okay, so just a little bit of backstory. Um, I'm the experience designer in IDEO's Play Lab. How many of you are familiar with IDEO? Oh, wow, okay. So you can give the talk. Great. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, can you guys hear me? Um, IDEO is a global design and innovation firm, and it is, uh, We've been around for about 40 years. You might be familiar with some of our early work. Um, we were known for creating products, such as the early, oh, um, oops, what did I do? <laughs> such as Games for Change. We use a, a methodology that's called design thinking, or human-centered design. And it turns out that you can use that to design literally everything. So we design now experiences, ventures, systems, etc. So recently, we, uh, we redesigned a voter experience for Los Angeles County. That's five million voters. That's the largest voting jurisdiction in the country. And we designed everything from the ballot um, box or booth to the technology, to the experience itself. So I work in the Play Lab, and we've got two teams. We have our toy inventors. These are generally our mechanical engineers, product designers, industrial designers, and they're coming up with goofy uh, concepts around toys, games, and apps, and selling them to brands such as Hasbro, Mattel, Sesame Street, et cetera. So a lot of the things, and they've been doing this for 20 years, so a lot of the things that are currently on the market um, may have originated in our Play Lab. On the other hand, you've got Play Consultants, that's the team that I'm a part of, and yes, we work on play and family-related um, or entertainment-related projects, but we also bring the power of play, what um, is useful about play to create uh, connection and curiosity and resilience and, um, and facilitate learning, and we bring that across a whole range of industries. So for example, um, out of the Play Lab, we've designed, uh, we've helped uh, national parks redesign their visitor experience. Um, we've helped to uh, design risk tolerance games for new investors, figuring out how they want to invest. Um, we've helped to design smoking cessation tools, et cetera. So the point is, oh, and yeah, we work closely together. The point is that clients will often come to us and say, hey, Play Lab, can you help us make, insert toy game, concept experience here, fun. And we will say yes, but unfortunately, there's no secret formula. You can't paint fun on like varnish. It has to be part of the entire process, and um, usually it kind of feels something like lassoing smoke. It's a bit of a, um, an elusive process. But fortunately, I have had the privilege of designing playful experiences over the past 15 years, and working alongside brilliant people who have done the same, and I've come across five golden rules for making something fun. It's been really useful for me, and I hope that you find it useful as well. So I'm gonna blaze through these rules, um, and then I'm gonna explain what I mean by these rules and give you some real world case studies that ha show how these rules come to life. So, first rule, never ever, ever, ever say, <laughs> This is gonna be fun! Talk more about that later. Number two, make sure it actually is fun. I know that sounds cheeky, I promise there's logic behind it. Rule number three, design for diverse heroes. Rule number four, play test, play test, play test. And rule number five, party on dudes, be excellent to each other. All right, so what do we mean by this? Rule number one, never ever say this will be fun, 
Why? Because fun is subjective. Everybody has their very own definition of what fun is. If you try to mandate it or set expectations, you're going to be met with resistance. Trust me, I've tried. It's a losing battle. And to be honest, the best kind of fun isn't mandated anyways. It's not someone telling you you're going to have fun. It happens organically. Fun is emergent. It is collaborative at its, you know, at its best. And so as a play designer, I like to think about designing not fun, but a catalyst, a fire starter, a framework in which you can um, energize people to create their own fun. So, uh, for example, a few years, years ago, uh, a client came to IDEO and said, hey, we want to make STEM education more interactive and engaging for middle school students. And we want to make sure that this uh, tool, this resource, is available to the most under-resourced schools in the school district, so it has to be mobile. I said, okay, well, so we took a bus, like a big old bus, and with our in-house game designers and a team of very talented voiceover actors and a full orchestra and the industrial designers behind Pimp My Ride, we converted this bus into an immersive experience. So when the students stepped onto the bus, it turned into a spaceship and it brought them to Mars. And on the way to Mars, they got a message from NASA that said, Houston, we have a problem. You guys have to help us save the Curiosity rover. And so for the rest of the experience, they played a series of collaborative, hands-on learning games um, to, to do just that. And then when they got off the bus, there was a week-long curriculum that the teachers could bring back that brought this experience back into the classroom. Now, if you're sitting on this bus during this experience, it's noisy. It's fun. Kids are high-fiving and shouting and, and clapping and, and, and laughing. But at no point in that 30 minutes with that swell of the orchestral strings and the voiceover actors, at no point in that week-long curriculum afterwards do we say, hey kids, you're going to have fun. Instead, what we did was we focused on creating the right environment to light up their imagination, to give them the tools that they needed to tackle challenges that required focus but didn't seem too unattainable. We allowed them to create fun for themselves. Now, how do you create a catalyst? How do you create the right environments for fun? That's an 80 billion hour talk, which we will have to do another day. But just remember, never ever say, you're going to have fun. Rule number two, make sure it actually is fun. So there's a tendency to, especially when you, when you want to make something serious, more engaging, to take the trappings of fun and add it on. So points, badges, leadership, uh, leaderboards, and prizes. But the problem is that that only works for as long as the participant is dazzled by the prize and thinks that they can win it. The minute those two things are not true, when they're no longer dazzled, they don't think they can attain it, they're probably not going to participate. I love you, United, but if I don't think I'm going to get this round trip flight, I probably wouldn't fly with you because, honestly, it's not that fun. But um, when I'm designing to make something fun, I'm thinking about, well, what would people want to do anyways? What are people excited by regardless of this issue? And then what are ways that you can marry it creatively, dynamically, in an interesting way with a cause that you care about? So for example, uh, a few years ago, so prior to working at IDEO, I worked at a company called The Go Game. We designed um, interactive adventure games around the world. And for one day in 2014, for funsies on a Saturday, we decided to design a zombie apocalypse disaster preparedness game where um, teams could get together and run around the city and do a series of fun and ridiculous and useful challenges such as learning what radio station to tune into during a disaster, um, learn how to gut a fish, um, learn how to do CPR, learn how to create their family communication plan, um, all while they were getting chased by zombies. And don't worry, we hid caches of Nerf guns throughout, so they were well prepared. Um, and it culminated in a thriller flash mob in a local park. <laughs> so this was awesome. It was super fun, and it got a lot of attention. Um, because of the attention, the city of San Francisco reached out to us and said, hey, you know what? You know, we've been trying to make disaster preparedness, uh, or people more prepared, since, I don't know, 1906. Um, and you just add in zombies and people now can't get enough of this, let's, let's collaborate. And that kicked off a series of disaster preparedness games that over the next few years we brought across the country to make um, communities, uh, to give them the opportunity to prepare themselves for wildfires, hurricanes, floods, tsunamis, et cetera. 
Now, if we had just taken this, this going back here, you know, we want to make public safety and urban resilience more fun and just give people points or prizes for collecting their go bags, that may work for some people, but it's not really a sustainable model in the long term. So instead, and really if you think about it, why would someone get prepared? There's this narrative in disaster preparedness that I've heard a lot, and actually it, I, I hear it in a lot of different places, and that is, well, people don't get prepared or people don't engage because they're apathetic. And I just don't believe that. Because if you think about motivations, and I'm not talking like um, at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs of like taking care of basic needs, I'm talking about aspirational motivations. Why on earth would you get prepared? Why would you take time out of your busy schedule, take away from your friends and family, to go out and take money that you may or may not have, to buy items that you may or may not need, for an event that quite frankly you don't want to ever think about, because it's terrifying. No wonder nobody is prepared. But instead, if you design an experience that is social, that is memorable, that is fun, that has spectacle, that you know, is Instagrammable, it gives you something to talk about with your community and reflect on a shared memory. And while you're doing that, you can check off a chore you've been meaning to do for a long time, like assemble your, your go bag. Ah, it's a slam dunk. So make sure the thing itself is fun. Make sure people would do it regardless of a prize. Make the thing fun, and in that, then you can activate people towards your cause. Okay, rule number three, design for diverse heroes. So as a game designer, I'm often thinking about how do I design for the hero moment? You guys know that feeling when you hit the ball out of the park, you know, you, you save the day right before the buzzer, that moment when it's all on you and you nail it. That's an intoxicating feeling. That's what it's all about. And so I'm often thinking about how to design for that. Thing is, um, everyone is a different kind of hero. Everyone has a different flavor of superhero power. So you have to make sure that you give everybody an opportunity to save the day. Especially, and this is true for any game, but especially for team-based games. You can't just design one path towards victory. Because, if, you, if especially if you have a team, if not everyone gets that chance to be the hero, they're probably going to walk away from the experience and think, man, that wasn't very fun. So, uh, for example, a few years ago, again, this was with the Go game, um, a client came to us and said, hey, we want to create a game for transportation policy makers that helps them think about the commute experience and design policy that makes it better. And what we don't want to have happen is for them to lock themselves in a room and make only database decisions because there's so much more to this experience. We want them to go out and really stand, step in the shoes of the commuter, understand the, um, the experience, and not only how to make it efficient, but how to make it enjoyable. So this game took place in three different cities around the world, uh, Istanbul, Bangkok, and DC, and it took place on the public transportation unique to each city. So in DC, it was the metro, in Bangkok, it was um, rickshaws, and in Istanbul, it's these historic trains you see right here. And we knew that the players, and we spent a lot of time trying to understand you know, who the players were, where they're, where they're coming from, um, human-centered design, and we knew that they were very diverse, that we had some extroverts, we had some introverts, we had people with very different sets of skills. So we had to make sure to design missions that spoke to each one of them. So for example, we had one mission that really uh, was popular amongst the extroverts, where they had to go into a crowded station, play a Michael Jackson song, and do the moonwalk to uh, summon a secret agent that was hiding in plain sight. They would come out and give a, uh, a, a clue for the team to move on. So if you're um, into that kind of spectacle, that might give you a nice adrenaline rush. Um, if you're not into that kind of spectacle, that may make you want to curl up and die. So <laughs> we created different kinds of missions. Another type of mission for those more um, quiet internal processors, we created a mission with a, a metro map and you had to fold it in a very specific, almost origami style um, shape and take the DC metro card, which has a hole punch, or at least the time it did at the very top, and place it at a very specific angle over the shape you created. And through the punch hole, you would see the station that you had to go to next. So these were missions that happened throughout the game, and they often happened concurrently, so people could really divide and conquer. It was important that everybody saw the impact that they had in driving towards their, their team's victory. Ah, yes, and more pictures. 
picture is relevant. So the fourth, the fourth rule, playtest, playtest, playtest. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this term, although I'm pretty sure with this crowd, we know what it is, but it's basically prototyping with lots of giggling. Um, I, I would highly recommend that you play test more than you think you need to. And when I say play test, and again, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, I'm not saying like a focus group, you're putting something that you've created in front of a group to validate it. What you're doing is putting an early prototype in front of a group to co-create with them. You're, you're putting something rough and rapid in front of them for them to break it and to restructure it with you. Um, so, oh, and the reason why that's important, anyone who's, who's done lots of play testing knows, you will learn a billion more things in an hour's worth of play testing than spending a week doing a lot of interviews and talking to a lot of experts and trying to guess at what people will do when they play. So back before the uh, midterm elections, some friends and I got together and um, decided that we wanted to make the civic engagement experience, specifically the voter education experience, more fun, or at least less brutal. Because, anyone from California? Yeah, our ballot is really long, and there's a lot on there. So we did a lot of play tests. We tried a lot of different things. And what we realized early on in this play test, one of the insights that surfaced is that Many people don't feel comfortable engaging in, in political discourse because they're ashamed of their perceived lack of expertise. So they don't want to open their mouth for fear of sounding ignorant around any issue, particularly local issues, which are really hard to keep track of. So what we created was a bit of a, um, almost like a baseball card system. So this is a party game. When you arrived at the party, you got a little um, guide, a ballot guide, which had all the things that would show up on the ballot, but it was blank. And then you also got a little, almost like baseball card that represented a, a measure on the ballot or a race. And on that baseball card, you had the, the things that you needed to know, like a one-liner about what the issue was, the arguments in favor, the arguments against it, who endorsed it, and who funded it. These are all critical details for um, any election. So when you arrived at the party, you got a baseball card, you got your guide, you had a few minutes to kind of absorb what was on your card, and you were told, just absorb it long enough so you can teach it to somebody else. Because as I'm sure you guys are all well aware, teaching is one of the best ways of learning. And pretty soon it became a race, speed dating for a ballot. So you had to run around the party and teach as many people about your baseball card and learn from as many people about theirs to fill out your ballot guide. Because at the end, we cluster people into little um, pub style trivia rounds and tested them based on how much information they were able to collect. But what was really amazing about this format of the baseball cards is that it leveled a playing field. So anybody could arrive to that party with any level of expertise and it didn't make it awkward. Also, it allowed for collaborative learning. So um, if someone was presenting their baseball card and the, their partner asked them a question they didn't know the answer, we saw people organically hop on the Google and look it up together. Um, so it really created these interesting, dynamic, co-learning moments that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And play testing was a critical part of this process. If we had not been play testing since day one, we wouldn't have surfaced that insight, and this probably would have taken a completely different form factor, which may not have been as successful. And as it turns out, we created something, a template that was shared nationally, so it didn't just stay in California. So play test, play test, play test. I would say, make sure you have play testing at least a quarter of your entire design process at a bare minimum. But if it were up to me, we'd play test all the ding dong day. Okay, <laughs> rule number five, party on dudes, be excellent to each other. So we have this, oh well, maybe not people at this conference, but in general there's this sensation that if you wanna make serious change, then you have to do it in a serious way. But at the end of the day, sometimes the best way to create change is to throw a raging party, a really, really great gathering, um, either online, but I, I favor the meat world, where you bring people together in a, in, a, in a lovely social setting. But it's not good enough just to create a great party. You also have to create the conditions so that at the party, people can play well together. I'll explain what I mean by that. So prior to working at um, Designing Adventure Games and, and then working in the Play Lab, I worked here in New York in nightlife and daylife, um, but you know, through, through parties and events, Central Park Summer Stage, warehouse parties, corporate events, everything in between. And back in 2009 with some friends, 
I decided to put together a party that was all about reducing textile waste through parties. And the way that it worked, it was called SCORE. Um, the way that it worked was that everyone, this was like a roving pop-up department store where everything was free. So as an attendee, you brought whatever stuff you were meaning to get rid of, um, your toys, books, records, household items, bike parts, you name it. And once you got to the event, you um, paid to get in on a siding scale. And once you're inside, the space was divided into departments. And each department was curated by a different brand or organization. So for example, we had Etsy curating the craft department and Nylon Magazine, which is a fashion magazine, curating the clothes department. So these uh, curators were live merchandising the departments as the supplies were coming in, making them look like a department store. And so once you were inside, you could wander around and take as much as you wanted for free. Now, meanwhile, we had DJs and food trucks and screen printing and nail art and dance parties and picnics. It was a mini festival. And what was cool about this party was that kind of by accident, we created a closed loop system. We created a, a little mini circular economy where the proceeds from the door went to the nonprofit partner that we worked with the, for that particular event. The revenue from the bar went to offset the, ve the venue costs. And we partnered with a textile recycler that took all of the textiles that could, would not, were not swapped and could not be donated, things that were um, ripped, stained, just unusable, and they purchased them in bulk and turn them into commercial insulation. So that revenue stream covered the operation of the party, the operational costs. So it w like I said, it's not just about throwing a good party, it's about creating a situation where people can be excellent to each other. And we knew going to this, we didn't know a lot, we were, we were making a lot of assumptions, but one thing that we had a hunch about was that if you create a swap at this scale, we, you know, each party would be a couple hundred or a couple thousand people, so it's, it was fairly large. Um, we knew it ran the risk of devolving into a Barney sample sale style frenzy where people get really grabby and, um, and not so nice to each other. So we deliberately designed interventions so that people had other things to do aside from just taking. And that's where the dancing came in, that's where the nail art, that's where the activities came in, which gave people not only a break from the transactional um, quality of the event, but also it gave them an excuse to make eye contact and meaningful connections with strangers. So, uh, oh, I'm missing my, you know, you know what, we're gonna go back to the beginning, just to recap. So, to recap, these are the five rules, right? Number one, Never, ever, ever say this is gonna be fun, but instead create the catalysts and conditions for people to create their own fun. Number two, make sure it actually is fun, so don't just try to tack on the trappings of fun, but think about what people would want to do anyways and join it with whatever cause or, or um, activity that you would like to promote. Number three, design for diverse heroes. Make sure everybody has a chance to save the day. Number four, play test, play test, play test more than you think is necessary all the time. And number five, party on dudes, be excellent to each other. Don't be afraid of taking something serious and turn it into a celebration, but make sure you're creating the right vessel so that people are excellent to each other. So that was a lot. Um, I, I am happy to open up to questions or, um, or stick around after. If you are um, not the kind of person that likes to raise your hand or talk to the speaker afterwards, that's okay. Um, please be in touch anyways. Um, I would love to hear from you if you have any questions or ideas. Um, but I would say I actually saved the most important rule for last, um, and that is as you go out and create change and impact, the thing that you want to do and that the world needs, uh, it's really important that you too have a good time because otherwise it's really hard to sustain the work, right? You risk burnout. So think about designing play and fun for yourself as much as designing it for others. Um, if laughter and play wasn't critical to who we are as a species, we probably would have evolved past it by now. So don't resist, don't um, tamp down those impulses. Enjoy yourself every step of the way. Don't forget to use keynote animations. Yeah. <laughs>